So hi everyone and um, welcome back day one of Embedded Open Source Summit, um, second talk of the day. So hopefully you'll get a nice opening to this week full of very cool events. Um, let's start with our title. Um, this is when we originally planned this presentation, this is the title we came up with. And I think it's pretty catchy, porting an AI powered health wearable, uh, health, wearable health monitor to Zephyr on open hardware. Um, our goal for the project was to um, embed ourselves more into the Zephyr project and learn more about some open hardware we wanted to try out um, and software. However, reality of embedded software development and computer science in general is that, well, as you most know here, plans don't always exactly go as we want them to. So if we were actually to retitle the presentation so it more accurately reflects what we spent most of our time on working on this project, it definitely wouldn't be this. It would be sort of something like this. Um, but again, this is not as catchy and uh, it's definitely a bit too long, uh, but it definitely kind of <laughs> encapsulates uh, what we worked on. So, Kuba, why don't you tell us what we will be covering today? Yeah, sure. So, our presentation follows a standard war story flow where we touch upon each subject and then um, cover how things were supposed to look like and what they actually were in reality. So, who are we? So, this is me on the left. Uh, I'm currently leading a team in, uh, at Tieto Every for undisclo undisclosed client. Uh, and we're doing 5G networks, L1, L2 stack. Uh, I also graduated some time ago from MSC in embedded systems. And in my free time, I do some sports and, uh, well, climbing, surfing, windsurfing, etc. But I'm currently after my knee ACL reconstruction, so I might be slow to walk around. Uh, and this is Shimon. Yeah, hi all. And this is Jakub, by the way. <laughs> so uh, I'm an open technology engineer at Avanad, uh, which basically means I get to play around with some open source during working hours, which is always cool. Um, I'm currently co-chairing the CarbonOS SDK project, which is a green software foundation project. Feel free to check it out afterwards. There are links, basically all the blue hyperlinks will be links to the actual projects. Um, and I'm also a final year Masters of Engineering Computer Science student at the University College London. Um, in my spare time, I dabble in the areas of game development, uh, embedded systems, IoT, and I'm pretty crazy about uh, windsurfing. So, what the motivation was for our project? It was a, a goal to create a, a health wearable monitor that can measure the blood pressure in a non-invasive way uh, using photoplethysmography. I'll tell you in a moment what's that. Uh, so why choose this problem? Uh, initially, it was a part of a design for a cause uh, competition that we took part in. Uh, and it was during the pandemic. And we all know how everything was uh, overwhelmed back then. I guess everyone is already fed up with this topic, so I won't dig into it more. Uh, and what it allowed for, it allowed for um, monitoring um, elderly people and even ourselves uh, with our smartwatches, for example. So it was a non-invasive way to monitor our vital signals. Uh, and of course, we chose it uh, to learn new thing, so that's why we ported in it to Zephyr. Um, so the original plan, uh, original project was basically uh, looking like this. It was based on closed source Arduino Nano 33 IoT that was connected to Max 30102 PPG sensor. It also had a small LCD display. Uh, and some buttons for, for uh, as 
as actuators. It was a low power device, so it went into sleep and deep sleep, etc. Et and since it wasn't capable of uh, having a full AI model deployed on premises, uh, we used uh, AWS Lambda for the inference part and it communicated using MQTT. Um, also, since not everywhere Wi-Fi was present, a companion app was necessary to, to be able to communicate with the uh, Wi-Fi. Mm. So yeah, as I mentioned, it, it was originally a part of a competition. Uh, and yeah. Basically, on the right, you can see uh, a nice 3D model uh, we did back when we were developing the project. And then on the left, you can see how it actually looked like printed out and fully assembled. So in my opinion, it looks really nice. It's pretty bulky for a, for a health monitor, right? But like, bear in mind, this was just a prototype to, 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 to test a theory of ours. Um, and all of the blogs and info about that project you can find through the URLs here on Jakub's blog. So um, obviously the next step um, for this project was to bring this to open source. Uh, open source RTOS and some open hardware. So say hello to uh, Zephyr and QuickLogic EOS is free. Um, Kuba, why don't you yeah, continue introducing this a little bit? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so our new hardware was QuickLogic Qt+, Plus, which was running uh, EOS S3 SOC, which allowed, uh, well, it combined and embedded FPGA with ARM Cortex-M4 MCU, which was capable of deploying uh, machine learning models on directly on the board. That's why we basically chose it. The reality was a little bit different. We'll tell you a little bit why. Uh, in a moment. Uh, so what was the key selling point to us? What were the key selling points? So uh, it had sensor fusion engine, so flexible fusion engine and sensor manager that basically offloaded uh, computations uh, on sensors and data collection. Uh, it had uh, the embedded FPGA. Uh, it was low power SOC. Uh, apparently allows for I square S always on PDM microphone data collection. So it sounds pretty cool. Uh, well, we, yeah. we all should know that all fans change when met with reality. As a quote of uh, Helmut von Moltke I found from the 19th century says, uh, well, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Uh, in our case, uh, the enemy was, uh, was, I guess, trusting the branding side of the SOC and not actually looking too deeply in the Zephyr co source code uh, before committing to the particular board. Um, we may have mentioned, or we haven't, basically, they, they stated they had full Zephyr support for the board, which there was Zephyr support, I agree that, but full was a tiny bit of a stretch. Um, don't get me wrong, we really, really like the SOC. Like, it's very fun to work with it now. It has a lot of very cool features. It's really low power and it's really powerful for how little it is. Uh, but it was definitely a little bit difficult to get started. Um, however, in hindsight, if we didn't have to deal with all of these issues and this project didn't turn into kind of a war story, we'd never learn so much about the actual hardware. We'd never be able to add some Zephyr support for it and we wouldn't learn so much about Zephyr. Um, so, the first issue that came about when we got the board uh, was, well, with board flashing. Uh, pretty, you know, generic. Um, when we received the boards, we were very excited to get started and start coding right away. Um, unfortunately, after trying to flash some custom Cortex M4 applications and doing some digging on GitHub and seeing that, well, nothing was really flashing to the board, we realized that the bootloader of the board was completely borked. Like it just didn't work, the one that came with. Um, so this was the first issue we encountered and luckily we found some correct sources on uh, QuickLogic um, forum and GitHub for uh, reflashing it with uh, jailing debugger and what to follow. They had some s a specific program to, to load up um, on, the, on the board 
And this worked perfectly fine for Jakub, as he had a J-Link with him. Unfortunately for me at the time, Jakub was in Warsaw, I was in London, I didn't have a J-Link, all I had was an ST-Link and OpenOCD. Uh, so I decided to take an open source alternative route and, and try it out. Um, and yeah, so I went for OpenOCD and tried it. Unfortunately for me, I quickly realized EOS's free flashing driver uh, was not upstreamed to, to OpenOCD. Um, and, well, I'm guessing everyone is aware of the Open Ocean Debugger pro project, so I will not be introducing it. Um, logically, I jumped to OpenOCD's IRC and checked in with the community where I could find more info about it um, and was pointed to a patch by uh, Paul Furster um, that actually added an EOS S3 uh, flashing driver. So I rebased the, it was a little bit outdated because it didn't get merged in at the time when he, when he wrote it. So I rebased it and uh, uh, tried it out basically, yeah. Unfortunately, um, as you might have guessed by now, uh, it did not work. Um, it failed on flashing when sending a um, read ID, RDID, um, SPI flash command and never actually, oh, no, never. It didn't receive the proper ID of the onboard flash uh, when doing that uh, from of the quick thing plus board. So instead what I actually received, if you look at the red line at the very top, was a bunch of zeros. And what I wanted to get was uh, GD256Q16CID, which is written out down there. Um, I spent, well, basically a week trying to understand how OpenOCD works in a little bit more, because I never actually had to dig into it, and what was wrong with the driver. And I tried even forcing um, the driver to select the correct flash device no matter what. So just to pick that flash device and try writing on the board, see what happens. Um, as you might have guessed, since that command didn't go through, this didn't go too well, I completely destroyed the boot load that was already on board. It just, when I plugged it in, nothing happened. Yeah, that was not uh, cool. So at the time, I was a bit, well, pressured by time because I wanted to get this done before, <laughs> before this event as well. And also, I didn't want to um, continue sitting on this without much progress. So I put it aside. I grabbed myself a J-Link, which I'm not most proud of, I should have, but I'm planning to get back into this and actually upstream the fix for, for the patch. So future, future folks working with this won't have the same issue. Um, so yeah, so I moved on from that and went on to um, using a J-Link. I flashed it, worked fine. So now I have a bootloader, Kuba has a bootloader, ready to go, ready to go into Zephyr. Yeah, so about that. Uh, well, it turned out that some peripherals were not really supported. Uh, we had clocks and UART, and then we decided, yeah, let's connect a sensor. And GPIOs. Uh, and GP, yeah, well, mostly. Uh, and yeah, we went on to adding the support to sensor manager. Well, it turns out that this is a uh, very low power DSP that has its own programming language. And it turned out that adding support for that in Zephyr might be a little bit too much. So yeah, what we did, we thought that yeah, I2C devices are mapped on the wishbone bus. So let's just use the I2C directly. And yes and no, it turned out that it also had some steps in order to work. Uh, and we decided to ditch the sensor manager for now. Maybe we'll add support for it sometime in the future. But, but Robert from Quick Logic told us that uh, only a handful of their clients were using it successfully and it had an obscure technical reference manual so we decided to do that i square c and yeah there is i started to port the hull uh of of uh this board to zephyr and coded the 
initial code for ice core C support, and then Shimon to cover. So yeah, cover it. So I'll cover that. So basically, uh, what did we end up doing to improve the boards and the socks support on Zephyr? Uh, we started by reading a lot of uh, quick logics. Uh, Quark SDK code and uh, previous Ant Micros uh, sponsor of this conference. So shout out to them. Work on the entry Zephyr support, which we are very thankful for because it gave us a very, very solid starting point. The Quark SDK is basically a free RTOS fork developed by uh, Quick Logic. And we added IceCourse C and Wishbone bus uh, support to the um, hardware abstraction layer module for Zephyr. And then we uh, added the actual I2C driver for EOS S3 uh, in Zephyr. Um, yeah, so I'm just looking around it to see, to see the screen as well, um, if I'm not missing anything. Um, so why did we actually have to do that? As you can see, we're just jumping here back for a second. There, this is the sensor processing subsystem on the SOC, and there is what's called a flexible fusion engine, and that is connected to the wishbone buses. And that's basically how we are reading, uh, we are communicating with the i 2 c bus through, through the wishbone bus through the flexible fusion engine. Um, so the first blocker we had when uh, porting the, um, the HAL that was already there for the free RTOS version to Zephyr was that the flexible fusion engine was, uh, was not enabled. It was being enabled uh, somewhere in the uh, free RTOS version, but it was never done in, for, for the Zephyr port. Um, so um, what we did here is uh, we read through that, we looked at the technical reference manual, and uh, we modified the code in the uh, SOX initialization, which is located, I yeah, put the reference to it, in SOC Iron Quick Logic EOSS3 SOC.C, so the, the program that runs on SOC initializa initialization, and we added, first of all, enabling flexible fu uh, fusion engine power domain, lines 63 to 65, then waking it up on like 67, setting up all the clock sources, and setting up the clock divider ratios, which, uh, yeah, on line 78 through 81. And then finally, routing those uh, clock signals to the actual i 2 c peripherals. Um, after enabling uh, f uh, the flexible fusion engine, uh, I actually got to test the uh, i 2 c HAL on Zephyr. And I first introduced a small change to it uh, to fix a bug which I discovered at the time where the, uh, when I was testing the HAL on QuickLogic for RTOS. Basically, after each, um, after each wishbone bus transmission that actually went out to the i 2 c device's uh, data register, there was a tiny delay for the message to actually be transmitted or received. And the actual bug happens when there is another wishbone bus write or read um, command right after that. And then the FFE is still busy handling the previous command, and according to how the code was wrote at the time, it just crashed, so the i 2 c command failed. Um, how I actually discovered the bug was uh, pretty funny, because I just added, well, the classic way of adding print statements after every single, <laughs> after every single wishbone bus sent. And this introduced enough delay <laughs> for the message to start going through. So I was like, okay, it fails at this print, so let's see what happens before the print when I remove it. And then I knew step by step in which section it, it failed. So what I did is I added a busy loop that uh, waited for the register to, to clear up um, after each such command and at the moment, that's how uh, I added it. It worked fine for me, so for now I'm keeping it. Maybe there's a better option, but I thought this might be the best one for now. Um, and after that, I was very excited to get to the actual driver adding stage. Uh, having worked a little bit with Zephyr before, I beforehand tried adding support for a board called Vue Terminal, which I managed to add some minimal support, but then someone else picked it up and actually we now have support for the board, so thanks be to them. But th this gave me some experience to know that after having some drivers, it's pretty, it goes pretty much downhill from there for app development. Um, so I implemented the driver based on the HAL that you've seen previously, 
and uh, we found some really great resources from last, last year's Zephyr Project Developer Summit on driver development by, sorry if I butchered the name, Gerard Marul Paretas. And it really helped us a lot to get a good understanding of uh, how drivers work uh, in the Zephyr system. Um, it was a bit tricky for me being not, a, not really a kernel dev and a Zephyr newbie to uh, uh, imp implement the driver, but, but manageable. So we followed the logical, like the normal flow of modifying the driver CMake list to build the files we want for the driver, add the kconfig file for our driver, modify the main kconfig file to import that other kconfig file, then add the DTS bindings in the proper location for it, and uh, finally add the actual source code for the driver. And well, at the very end, update the SOC's DTS to include the new peripheral, the new I2C peripheral. Um, a quick note of what I had an issue with at the time is I mistyped the binding, so it did not match the DT driver compat macro defined in the C source code. And well, I've learned the hard way that this is very much crucial for the uh, actual driver to ever be linked properly and to be included uh, in the DTS. Um, so finally, after adding the actual source code for the driver, it was time to get to the actual adding of I2C peripherals, I2C devices. So, as predicted by us previously, and what we are very happy with, uh, adding the sensor, the SPO2 sensor, Max3010 support, was basically as simple as adding a DTS definition, right? We just dropped it in the uh, device DTS with the, where the I2C is defined. Uh, we had to change a few configs just to configure our device. Um, yeah, small thing. You may notice that on the right it's 30101, and we use 30102, which are pretty similar. So that's why we decided to use the existing driver. Yeah, there is a, a, a thanks, Kubafelt. There is a driver in Zephyr tree for Max 30101 dri uh, device, which is yeah. Similar enough to Max 30102, uh, there's just a difference in Max. The, the, pre, the, the, the first one has another LED, which we just don't have to use. Um, so it wasn't too big. Um, and we just used that. We then set up the driver, enable, enabled those two LEDs we wanted to use. So IR and red uh, LED. We changed the um, current of the pulses of the LEDs to not be maximum because we realized that when it was max, um, our values red always hit the ceiling and we didn't get the actual uh, resolution of the sensor. And then we changed some sampling uh, configs. Similarly for the display, again, I was really amazed by this, but after I added the driver, just like things worked, uh, which for me was like a very great achievement. I was very happy with myself. Adding the display support, the SSD1306, was also as simply as adding a DTS definition. There already was support for it in entry. There were some great samples for using it. Uh, so really kudos to whoever added that. I haven't looked at uh, Git Blame, but we'll do afterwards and add them to the list of people that helped me. And uh, it just needed a definition in the DTS a few configs and we were uh, ready to go, go. Oh yeah, we had to add dynamic memory allocation uh, for that specific sample we used. Um, yeah. yeah, it's one small pain point that we encountered was that uh, there is apparently a, a USB to UART on board, uh, but it requires a FPGA IP component that's being loaded on boot by the bootloader. Uh, and the driver for that is not in Zephyr, it's, it's written in FreeRTOS. So when we started working on this project, it turned out that, well, we cannot use the USB for printing logs. So, but thankfully hardware pins for UART were exposed and it worked out of the box. So, uh, quick tip, I bet you all know that, that if you don't have USB to UART converter, you can simply add another board as a listener and yeah, and listen on, on the pins there. Uh, so, 
I guess you're pretty tired already, so I'll try to be brief here. Uh, I will talk a little bit about deploying a machine learning model on EOS S3. So our initial goal was to deploy the model on the embedded FPGA. Uh, it turned out that it wasn't powerful enough. It only had two 32 by 32 multipliers. Uh, so it wouldn't fit any sensible machine learning model. It's, it's rather used as a companion, as I said, for, for USB to uh, UART or some other uh, offloading operations. Um, thankfully, we could deploy the model on, on the Cortex-M4. Uh, and there, what we did was we had to choose, use SenseML or use just raw TensorFlow light for microcontrollers. And as for SenseML, it's an entire suite for data capture, labeling, aggregation, and whatnot. Uh, and it turned out to not be as straightforward to perform the, the, just the, the inference on it. Uh, so we decided to not dig deeper into that. It looks really solid from the point of data collection, labeling, aggregation, etc. But for us, it was too much. We already had some data from an open data set that we wanted to simply deploy. So thankfully, TF Lite worked out of the box. There is a support in entry of Zephyr for that. It uses ARM, SMSYS, and then um, IP operations for acceleration of these uh, various machine learning operations that might be present there. Um, and what we had to do was to add quantization. And if you're not familiar with that, it's simply remapping values from one uh, range into the other. So in our case, it was floats to int eights, as that was our model was using underneath. It's, it simply uses a flood buffer of in, of, uh, of chars, basically, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, so during our talks with Robert from QuickLogic, uh, we were introduced to a different project from the open hardware group uh, called the Core 5 uh, MCU, and in generally the Core 5 uh, family of boards. Um, and it's a RISC-V board uh, with a much larger embedded FPGA. Um, and from what we understand, we would be able to drop uh, ML models on that FPGA. So if there is someone here from Open Hardware Group, we would really much would like to get our hands on the board and to try out getting uh, a machine learning model deployed on FPGA, FPGA running alongside an RTOS. It would be very cool. So I know they're somewhere around here. If they're not here, we'll find them afterwards. But yeah, just a quick interjection. <laughs> yeah, finally do what we were supposed to do with this board. Uh, so yeah, let's talk a little bit more about blood pressure prediction. I guess you all know what blood pressure is. Uh, I guess at this time it might be getting lower as we ate our breakfast some time ago. Uh, and yeah, photo platysmography called also PPG to not be very verbatim. Uh, it's a technique of uh, applying, well, infrared or red radiation from LED onto our skin and then measuring the reflected wave. So this way we may see our current heart, heart rate, for example, also our blood oxidization. Uh, and as in our case, we can also infer the blood pressure from it. So yeah, biological signals are pretty complex. Uh, as you can see on this graph, uh, I did it myself, so I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, <laughs> we have a systolic peak, for example, dichrotic notch, diastolic peak. And what we basically did was, instead of putting all uh, sampling period samples to the model, which in our case would be, for example, 200 samples, we decided to extract 
data from one such period. Uh, in this case, it, it was, for example, the peak ratio, cycle duration, and some deltas that are um, defined in the nomenclature, uh, in the literature um, of basically biological signal processing. So it ha it's a known problem, uh, and I'll, I will mention about the accuracy later, but I recently read that CNNs, which stand for convolutional neural networks, are really good at, at uh, processing these features. So yeah, instead of 200, now we have six inputs to the model, which makes it around one, one kilobyte. So it's really small. Uh, but still, we need to do data filtering and pre-processing on, on the MCU, which is, let's say, we have a classic space, um, space and execution time trade-off. So we need to sacrifice some processing speed to have the samples processed on the MCU. Uh, so yeah. One thing that's not on the slide here is that uh, I struggled a little bit with the accuracy of the pre-processing on the model. It turned out that, well, C++ implemented some things differently from Python in this case. Um, and the data set for uh, training will, will be mentioned in the by the end of the presentation, the ground truth for uh, this model training was from arterial blood pressure, which is an invasive method of, of measuring. Um, so yeah, depending on your needs, you may choose a smaller model and more data preprocessing, or you can go for a CNN, which w definitely won't be one kilobyte, I would say more like megabytes. Uh, and not all edge devices can afford that. Accuracy was pretty standard at the time I, I crafted the initial model. So mean average error is basically how, how different is the model regression value from the, or, or the predicted value from the, uh, ground truth and just averaging it. So for systolic blood pressure, 16.5. For diastolic, it's 8.3. Uh, yeah, some results of us. So this was actually what we originally wanted to present on, right? This, this whole small section that is encapsulated in basically a single two slides is uh, all including the AI on USS3 part. Uh, currently, all of this is just a prototype uh, sitting on a breadboard. Um, as you can see on the far right, we have the QuickThink Plus with the tiny USS3 sitting on it, the Max 30102 sensor connected to the screen, and then this is my setup, so USB32 as the USB to UART converter um, uh, or interface. And uh, we're planning to, well, polish of the software of it a little bit, so it's actually even more Zephyr-like and using more of, our, of the Zephyr features we wanted to exp experiment with, and redesigned the casing so it's a little bit nicer and looks more like our uh, previous project, so we can actually stick it in our hand and, uh, and try it out, test it maybe for a slightly longer period of time. Yes, yeah, so just for that, this is a big case and it's it's not a PCB that's crafted by us, it's just connecting some components, but if we were to do it professionally, we, I think we should design a PCB and put all the small things on, but yeah. Well. That's another thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> I know, like the smartwatch presentation might cover that. Yep. Um, so as always, uh, each project has much room for improvement and extensions. So let's mention some of the things we we'd like to uh, to cover. So apart from, um, this is me committing to it, uh, submitting PRs to Zephyr to upstream uh, the uh, I2C drivers for the board and some of the support for the um, HAL module of it, and also the OpenOCD flashing driver. Um, we um, have some things to figure out and debug. Uh, first of all is, 
whenever we actually configured the user button on board as GPIO input with, uh, with Zephyr. For some reason, it stopped working. When we make pinmux it and we didn't configure it, we were able to read the input from it. The moment we configured it, it's gone. Input is just always one or always zero. Um, so that's something to figure out. Um, bootloader on the board uh, might be broken. At least the one we got was broken. We had to do a little, um, little fixing of it or maybe just skipping some safety features of it to <laughs> to get it fully working as we wanted, but that's another thing to uh, explore. Um, what we were not fully happy with and we want to maybe look into uh, was the tiny FPGA programmer, since the board is a bit more complex. It's not just a MCU, it's an MCU of an F embedded FPGA. The programmer is written specifically for its tiny FPGA. Um, it's, in our experience, sometimes just hanged or crashed or on Mac OS or, Arch, uh, or Asahi Linux on the M1, it just didn't, uh, never really completed and never wrote it properly. Um, and the last thing we would want to do is actually using the FPGA, EFPGA on, on board the USS3 and doing some, um, some maybe uh, data processing on it. And yeah. One more thing, the flasher uh, had, had some Weird quirk that, for example, when we're flashing a constant size, uh, um, a binary, everything was fine. But then I tried putting much larger binary, and it simply wouldn't go through, and it, it suddenly bricked our board. Uh, and this this is kind of weird behavior, right? So we might want to debug the upstream and see. The, What's going on there? Yeah, yeah our, our fix for it was we flash the whole thing and try flashing the program with the bootloader. So like once the bootloader is flashing at the same time, flash the program, do it a few times, um, as I call it, warm up the flash and, and just <laughs> eventually started working fine on every single flash. It's just, I don't know why. So this is something definitely worth exploring. Oh yeah, um, also there is a Renode system emulator that we didn't have time to. Yeah. Explore, but apparently it's it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's a very cool system developed by Antmicro, and they have I think a uh, like a Zephyr dashboard for boards with Zephyr support, and that you can also emulate fully in Renode. So, as much as I understand it, you couldn't emulate the entire SOC uh, with it, which sounds very very cool. We didn't get to play with, it, but I'm guessing Antmicro will have some presentations today or during the week talking or at least mentioning it, or you can see it at their stand. Uh, talk to them at least. So uh, some acknowledgements. Uh, bear in mind, this is not everyone. If we were to put everyone, it probably would be quite a few people from the Zephyr project and others adding support for, for the things we already used. But big shout out to uh, Chris Fritz and Henry Riggs Andersen and a few other members of the Zephyr community for amazing help uh, during the project development. They were a great help when I just jumped in on Discord and were quick to uh, respond and reply with uh, with help for it and look, hoping for further help when PR guidance when uh, pushing it. Uh, Paul Fertzer for op from OpenCD for guidance in debugging OpenOCD and folks from Antmicro for paving the way to USS3 support in Zephyr. Um, yeah. yeah, you can find some of the links for further readings later on here. Uh, so feel free to uh, close the slides and, and look at it. Um, and quickly mention some of the takeaways, because I know we are close to time. Yeah, so when choosing a board to develop, check for peripheral support in Zephyr several times at least. Document your progress. You will thank yourself later. Uh, yeah, we told you how we approach adding I2C driver. Uh, you can use TF Lite uh, and yeah. Yeah, although when drivers again. are in place, Zephyr just works, so yeah. Exactly, I that's think a that's very nice takeaway, I think, which I think we should all be proud of and happy with. Yeah, um, and that's, that's it, all. thanks a lot, and Thank if you. you have any questions, yeah, you have, I think, a minute or two. Um, yeah, any questions? Does it work? Yeah, it works.
Oh, maybe, maybe I should oh, be doing the walk. walking. I have to flip. Um, I don't know, maybe you oh, can it, it, it. Hello, does it work? Oh, it's, I think it works. It fine. does. Uh, okay. Now it, I uh, know, it's me, sorry. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so what I didn't get I'll repeat. Is, did, did you use the FPGA on the board? Okay, so the, question, so the question was, did we use the FPGA for the model? And no, we did not. We were considering uh, using it and trying to flash something either way, but we were discouraged from doing that. So again, yeah, in okay. this project, we didn't use it in the end. Okay, um, I have a second question, if it's okay. Um, so, so you used this optical sensor, but then you, you had a quite a limited feature set, so six, six features. So, um, so in my opinion, uh, machine learning or neural networks uh, always thrive if you have like more features and don't you, you're not that strict in selecting and then I would be really interesting if you if you just broaden that and make the feature vector a bit bigger and maybe like more raw values and if you try to then interfere or uh, infer also like so you had blood pressure but you could also go for oxygen levels you could also go for like some hard anomalies I don't know so that would be really interesting to see I think yeah uh, thanks for that. Yeah, we. Uh, I can. Yeah, I can. Uh, so answering that, initially the model had 30 features. We did some. Okay, it's. I think we're. Yeah, out let's of just time. grab the question afterwards. So thanks everyone again, and uh, here yeah, are our socials me, if you want to grab let them. Let me and just wrap up for you guys here that uh, there's a chat session as well that you can engage in and ask additional questions. And I'd like to thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. And. Uh, yeah. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone.